Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining us for the February installment of Bracewell's Environmental Essentials for In-House Council webinar series. As many of you know, we do these monthly as a quick update on timely issues in environmental law. Uh, my name is Bob Wagman. I'm a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Bracewell in the government contracts practice. I'm joined today by my partner, Angela Stiles, who's also a partner in the government contracts practice here in D.C. Uh, so for today, we're going to provide a quick overview of the federal government suspension and debarment program. Part of that is we also want to dispel a few common misconceptions about suspension and debarment. And the titles probably want to uh, give away one of those uh, misconceptions we're going to try to dispel today. We also want to talk about some issues and some trends uh, specifically related to environmental enforcement because EPA has some, own, uh, some interesting and unique uh, provisions in their suspension and debarment program. Now, if you have any questions as we go through this, please type them in the comment box on your screen. We'll get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the webinar. We run out of time, we'll respond to those by follow-up email. Uh, also, you'll see at the end we have our contact information, so if you're not in the position of saying questions this morning, please feel free to reach out to us at your convenience, and we'll try to get back to you as quickly as we can. I just want to set the table real quickly about what we're talking about with suspension and debarment. So when you talk about government enforcement actions, there's three fundamental areas. It's criminal, civil, and administrative. Suspension and debarment is an administrative remedy. Uh, oftentimes, it's, it's going to be forgotten about when you're dealing with civil or criminal li potential liability, but it's one of those things that can be uh, really harmful to a company. I, I, I tell clients, you know, fines and penalties will hurt. Suspension and debarment can put you out of business. And in fact, there are a few companies that have been put out of business because of suspension and debarment. One of the things we want to mention at the outset is suspension and debarment is a remedial remedy, not a punitive remedy. Why that's important is that companies often will enter into settlement agreements where they'll get releases from government claims related to the covered conduct. That is not in, suspension and debarment is not included in those releases. So oftentimes you will see people uh, enter into settlement agreements with the government, get a complete release, and then be facing suspension and debarment sometime after that. So it's one of the things you want to be very conscious of uh, when facing enforcement activity. Uh, I also want to point out we're going to go through some of the basics and, and, and the process because the process really is counterintuitive with other enforcement type activities. You know, oftentimes it's good advice to see how things play out and, and to put the government to their proof. And when dealing with suspension and debarment, that tends to be not good advice. So let's just cover some of the basics. And before we get started, again, we'll talk about what. So you're talking about exclusion from all prospective business dealings with the government. And I, I, I'm very fond of a quote by Justice Breyer during oral argument a couple of years ago where he said, government money today is in everything. And of course, I exaggerate when I say everything, but only a little. So the government does business not just through government contracts, there's grants, guaranteed loans, many other things. And it also is going to apply to subcontractors, subgrantees. So even if you don't do business directly with the government, you could, be, you could be dealing with companies who will be prohibited from doing business with you because of their affiliation with the government. But let's talk about why. It's a lacking of present responsibility. And so that present responsibility is before entering into an agreement with a, a prospective offeror, Government has to make an affirmative determination that the contractor is presently responsible. That's going to include the financial wherewithal to perform the work, the facilities to perform the work, but it's also going to include a requirement, an affirmative determination that the contractor has a satisfactory record of integrity and business ethics. Um, and it's important to note that the underlying conduct does not need to be in connection with a federal grant or a federal contract that you can be found to be not presently responsible. Um, you know, who is going to be subject to suspension and debarment? It, it can apply to individuals as well as entities, corporations, partnerships, divisions, affiliate organizations. And again, the company of the individual does not need to be performing government contracts uh, in order to be in order to be facing suspension and debarment. And you know, we talk about uh, some examples of that. So, you know, Arthur Anderson related to the Enron uh, Enron matter. They were doing business with the federal government. The reason they got indicted and the reason they got in trouble had nothing to do with that government business, yet they were proposed, they were suspended when the company got indicted. Ultimately, the company went out of business before that suspension could end. Um, I've also dealt with individuals 
uh, you know, one case that comes to mind, an individual was facing a civil suit by the FCC related to a, a, a disputed uh, you know, sale leaseback agreement where the other side supposedly didn't book the, the transaction correctly. And that individual was proposed for suspension by the GSA. Um, we're gonna talk about when. So there's no set time. So it can often come in years after the underlying conduct has occurred, even years after you've entered into a settlement agreement. I think Angela said her, her high water mark was 10 years 10 after. 10 years after an SEC settlement, yes. So this can, it is something that can come back much later. So it, you do wanna be proactive and keep your eye on it. Now here's an example uh, of um, one such settlement. So you can see this was a, a company entered into a settlement with the Department of Justice in 2016. In 2018, they were proposed for debarment, or they were added to the suspension and debarment list in 2018. Now, SAM, as you'll see here, SAM is an acronym for the System for Award Management. This is maintained by the General Services Administration, and this is the central list of all excluded parties. Now, there's a couple different regulatory regimes we're going to touch on. There are some minor differences we're not going to get into, but there's the procurement rule and the non-procurement rule. So procurement, for example, if you're selling fuel to the government for fighter jets or cars, that's going to be procurement of goods or services under the procurement rule. There's also the non-procurement rule, which will apply to things such as grants or, you know, if you have leases to do drilling on federal lands, as an example, that would be under the non-procurement rule. There's a couple different avenues to get on the list maintained by GSA, but once you're on the list, uh, on the excluded list, it's, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be the same effect. I just want to touch on some statistics. Now, this is from fiscal year 2016. As of a couple of days ago, this was the most recent, uh, the 2017 statistics had not been released. I just want to point this out, talk about some recent trends um, and some of the numbers. In general, you're going to see many more suspension and debarment actions than you would have seen government-wide a few years ago. There's a few reasons for that. Um, one is, you know, congressional oversight is often interesting, that there has been uh, some talk of, of trying to make more mandatory debarment actions, statutory mandatory debarment actions. The, the common response to that is government officials deciding they're going to debar more people to show Congress they don't need statutory oversight to, for the suspension and debarment program. Um, oftentimes, you know, you're going to see the government will debar both entities and individuals out of the same transactions. There may be one company and five or six individuals working at that company who will all be uh, you know, proposed for debarment related to the same transaction. As you can see here, they only report numbers. So it, it's not clear if we're talking about you know, one company and, and five individuals are all counted the same. Uh, and this is also consistent with the recent, uh, you know, the Yates memo and the recent focus in you know, enforcement proceedings on individual accountability, you're seeing suspension and debar agencies proposing individuals for suspension and debarment with more regularity than you would have a few years ago. Um, I mean, you can see from the list here, you know, some agencies more than others are active, and that's a function of you know, more agencies are bigger, spend more money. But the, you know, you look at agencies like Department of Interior. A few years ago, I don't think Department of Interior was proposing anybody for suspension and debarment. Last year, they had you know, 26 debarments, which is you know, substantially more than they would have had you know, within the last few years. So now I want to talk a little bit about suspension and debarment policy. Uh, you can see the first one there is to protect the public interest. The federal government ensures the integrity of federal, federal programs by conducting business only with responsible persons. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, it, it, this is a remedial remedy. So as you can see, these policies are drafted in terms of protecting the government's interests as opposed to exacting compensation from a bad actor. Uh, again, the next one here, the federal agency uses the non-procurement debarment suspension system to exclude from federal programs persons who are not presently responsible. And again, we, we talked about the present responsibility. Suspension and debarment is, is a government-wide determination that the company of the individual is not presently responsible, cannot do business with the government. And the, the third one here is just it's the same process under the procurement rule that HC should only solicit offers and award contracts and consent to subcontract with responsible contractors only. Again, if you're, if you're on the excluded list, there's a determination that you're not presently responsible and therefore um, 
not able to do business with the government. We're going to talk a little bit about causes for suspension and debarment. So you've got you know, indictments, convictions, uh, other adequate evidence, which is pretty broad. Um, if you look at the various rules, there's going to be set out causes for suspension and debarment. So if you are convicted of a, a particular crime, that can be that establishes a basis for going ahead and debarring you. So they don't need to prove the underlying facts. The conviction itself is sufficient as a basis for debarment. An indictment, by the same, uh, you know, for, for suspension purposes, if a company is indicted, the agency is not going to need to show the underlying facts. Simply having an, the fact of the indictment, there's been a probable cause showing that is sufficient for a suspension uh, to justify a suspension of an entity. And there's also a catch-all uh, in the causes for suspension and barring, which is commission of any other offense indicating a lack of business integrity or business honesty that seriously and directly affects the present responsibility of a government contractor or subcontractor. You know, in almost every debarment matter I get, get involved with, that is always thrown in. So it might be a conviction, but they'll also say that it's the commission of another offense. It also is a hook basically to show that there, if it's not an enumerated offense, such as unre wholly unrelated to a government contract, agencies can still rely on this catch-all provision um, as a basis for debarring uh, an individual or a company. And one, most of what you're going to see, most of the suspension and debarment activities are going to be discretionary. So the government, generally speaking, has discretion who it's going to do business with. Um, Agencies prefer this because there are some companies that they don't want to debar because it make it very difficult for the agencies to carry out their mission. Um, sometimes you hear the, the, the notion that a company is too big to debar. It's not exactly correct, but sometimes that will come up in, in some conversations about this. The other is mandatory, uh, which is a statutory department, which is going to include certain, there are certain statutes that require the agencies to debar a company for a certain period of time. Uh, Again, I'm going to let Angela talk some more about those issues, and we'll deal with uh, some of the statutory issues. So thank you so much, Bob. Um, I actually think from the perspective of the attendees on this webinar, this may be the most important slide. There are all kinds of statutory departments. It's when Congress has decided that an issue is so important that they want to make sure that the company can no longer do business with the government if they actually violate a made in USA labeling law, or in this particular instance, if you violate the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act, and it includes misdemeanor crimes as well um, as more serious crimes as well. And so if you are ever facing an enforcement action under the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act, you need to realize that there's also this ancillary mandatory debarment that's going to happen no matter what your plea, unless you're able to move it to um, a civil agreement. Um, very, very important as you deal with Clean Air and Clean Water Act issues. So if you're in the midst of something with the Department of Justice or an assistant U.S. attorney dealing with either the Clean Water or the Clean Air Act, you really have to realize that part of your negotiation is also going to involve this statutory debarment issue at the EPA. Uh, there's certainly many, many ways to deal with it. So if you must accept a misdemeanor plea, um, there are many ways to deal with it that result in a very, very short debarment, but you have to be proactive about it. You have to approach um, the Environmental Protection Agency, suspension and debarment official, before you actually sign that settlement agreement if you want to limit the period of time uh, that your company or your particular facility will be under suspension or debarment. So you can proactively go to them before you actually sign a settlement agreement you can prove, you can certify, um, you can reach an agreement with the EPA debarring official that the condition giving rise to the conviction has been resolved. And you can actually do that in a fairly short period of time. There are times where um, the EPA wants to enter into an administrative agreement to feel a little bit more comfortable that um, over a period of time you're going to resolve the issues. So they will lift the suspension or the statutory debarment, if you will, um, for that period of time so that you can prove that you are a responsible company, that you have uh, resolved the conditions giving rise to uh, whatever the conviction actually was. 
Um, important to remember, though, if you proactively approach the EPA in these situations, you have the benefit of really being able to forum shop. You can choose whether you go to the regional office of EPA or you go to the central office of the EPA. There's a lot of good and valid reasons for going to one or the other, depending on your particular situation, um, in order to resolve the uh, ultimate statutory debarment that would result from a criminal conviction. Um, sometimes the central office is easier to deal with. Sometimes your local regional office is actually easier to deal with. But why? Why is this important? You may be thinking, I don't have any federal contracts. It doesn't matter to me if I'm suspended or debarred when I actually settle this. It actually turns out, I think, as you heard Bob talk about, is that the impact is a lot more than just federal prime contracts and subcontracts. You won't be able to get grants. You won't be able to get assistant awards. Um, the Department of Interior also believes that you should not get leases or other approvals from them while you are under suspension of debarment. Um, I have question marks by those because I'm not sure that their interpretation of their own regulation is actually a valid interpretation, but who wants to be in the position of actually having to challenge that? Um, it's much better uh, to resolve any suspension or debarment issue or potential issue, whether it's discretionary or mandatory, um, early and proactively so you're not having to get in a fight about that with the Department of Interior. I think it's also important because it affects your commercial business. There's a lot of companies that simply will not do business with a company that is debarred or under suspension. Um, they'll have codes of conduct, codes of ethics that say, we just, we checked you out beforehand. If we're already doing business with you, we're gonna stop doing business with you. That's not the kind of company that we do business with. State and local governments um, also recognize federal debarments and won't do business with you. And, and frankly, a lot of it has to do with the reputational impact of a suspension of debarment as well. Um, I have seen companies that were rumored to be uh, suspended or were going to be suspended in the near future, and I've seen their stock drop 20 to 30% just based on a rumor over a period of a week. So it is very significant and more than just not being able to do uh, contracting, prime or subcontracting with the federal government. So how does the process work? Well, each federal agency has a suspension and debarment official. They're selected by the head of the agency. They are career civil servants in the senior executive service, which means they're insulated from politics. You know, from time to time, uh, we will have companies that want to bring in senators, members of Congress, in order to lobby an agency out of a suspension and debarment. They are very offended by that, insulated from it. They are also offended when you bring in a political appointee from a higher level at the agency because they do believe that these are independent uh, decisions within their discretion that should never be influenced by politics. On the other hand, they're also not judges. They're not administrative law judges. They're not federal district court judges. And that means that the processes from agency to agency vary tremendously. So you can have an agency like the Environmental Protection Agency, they have a very well-structured, very formal process for how they approach suspension and debarment. Or you can have an agency like the Department of Interior, which is very informal. In fact, their entire process is run by their Inspector General's office, which is quite unusual. So each federal agency that you deal with um, will have a different approach to suspension and debarment. And it's very important to know that whether you end up in a position of being suspended or you're concerned you might be and want to proactively approach a suspension and debarment official, again, um, you can have the option of choosing which suspension and debarment official to go to if you think in advance, if you think about these issues proactively. Any suspension and debarment official in the, in the federal government can take cognizance over your case as long as you are able to make a case that they should be taking cognizance over it, and it may be better. So Interior might be better than EPA or HHS, depending on the type of business that you're doing with each of those agencies. Uh, as Bob discussed, and this is a highly subjective process. The standards are very subjective. If you, um, if the suspension and environment official really doesn't believe that you are a responsible company that understands whatever problems have arisen, and is taking care of those problems, it is very hard to overturn their decision to suspend you or to bar, to bar you. It's the way the system has been set up. Um, they have a whole lot of power in the hands of these civil servants. I will say that most of the time, 
most of the time. Um, they approach these things with an understanding of what this does to companies. They approach suspension and environment very carefully. Um, but if you get on the wrong side of one of these suspension and environment officials, it is very hard in courts to overturn them. Um, we have overturned them in court before, but it's expensive and it's not fun and it's better to work within the process, give them what they're looking for, um, prove to them that you are a responsible company, even in situations where something has gone wrong. How does the process work? Um, actual debarment requires 30 days notice. Uh, suspension can occur without any notice whatsoever and it can stay in place for 18 months. What usually happens is if there's a problem and you're dealing in the world of discretionary uh, suspensions and debarments, you'll get a proposed debarment with a suspension at the same time and an opportunity to be heard. Um, sometimes when there's, uh, there's enough evidence uh, but they don't, they're not ready to propose you for debarment, they will simply suspend you pending the completion of an investigation, pending more information. Um, you do get an opportunity to go in and speak with them, an opportunity to be heard, an opportunity to make filings at that point in time, um, but it can be pretty jarring to a company um, who, for example, doesn't do federal contracts and is suddenly suspended by a particular federal agency for something that, say, they read in the paper, which has happened before. Um, so they will take these kind of low subjective standards and they can read something in the paper and say, I don't like how that sounds. I don't like how this looks. I want to understand what this company is doing. Um, and they can issue a suspension. And that suspension oftentimes will be upheld uh, because the discretion is so broad. So what can you do um, in advance? So there are a lot of mitigating factors that a suspension and debarment official is supposed to take into consideration when they're considering um, suspending and, and or debarring you. Some of these things, as we'll go through them, you can take care of in advance. So having good policies and procedures for compliance in place already can be a very important mitigating factor. Uh, Certainly, most suspension and debarment officials recognize that even in the best of companies with platinum-plated compliance programs, things do go wrong. There are bad actors. Um, and so they want to see that you recognize up front that you needed to have policies, procedures, compliance in place. And this isn't just environmental compliance. This is full-scale compliance for your company, for them to consider you to be a responsible contractor. Um, but there's a number of other mitigating factors that are to be taken into consideration. So if you're confronting misconduct at your company, it's very important to keep in mind these mitigating factors. You'll find oftentimes on the, even the criminal and civil side, um, these are very important factors for the Department of Justice, but they're very important factors for the suspension and debarment official as well. Um, the extent that you planned, initiated, or carried out the wrongdoing, your acceptance of responsibility. I will tell you this is the most important issue when you walk into a suspension and debarment official, and sometimes the most difficult, because a lot of times you will be walking in before you have actually accepted a plea with the Department of Justice, and you've got to accept some level of responsibility for what happened and the seriousness of the misconduct, because they want to know that you recognize that it's an issue, You've taken care of it, you've investigated it, and you've remediated it. Payment of the penalties, um, whether it's pervasive within your organization, um, it's amazing how well they are able to spot out organizations where um, the culture, the tone at the top really isn't right, and they're concerned that they will decide you are presently responsible, responsible and you'll be back before them within a matter of months or years. And that's the last thing they want is to be the person who said, oh, no, this company's fine, to find out that the problems really weren't solved at a cultural level, if you will. Um, the kinds of positions held by the individuals involved in the wrongdoing, higher up in the organization, the worse it is for the organization, whether you took appropriate corrective and remedial action, whether people high up in the company tolerated the offense, whether managers that knew about it and didn't do anything about it, um, whether you brought it to the attention of the appropriate government officials. This is a big one. Um, did you, when you found out that there was a problem, go and knock on the appropriate official's door and bring it to their attention? Whether you fully investigated it, and while you're having somebody do that investigation, internally or externally, 
realize that they're going to want to see a copy of that investigation. That's one of the prongs that's a mitigating factor. This is the one we discussed before, whether you had effective standards of conduct and internal controls in place. Did you have an effective compliance program? That's what they're asking. Did you have one in place before? What are you doing to change it to make it better so this doesn't happen again? And then another really big one is the disciplinary action taken against the individuals. And they look not to just the bad actors, but the people that the bad actors reported to. You know, have, is there a letter in their file? Did they not receive a bonus in the year that this happened? What did you do to make sure from a disciplinary perspective that this won't happen again? As I think we've already mentioned several times, um, there is an appeal process for suspension and debarment. It goes to the federal district court. A lot of times I would say that the DC district court is just more sophisticated, used to these type of cases, so that's where you usually find them, but not always. Um, the standard of review is under the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, you really have to prove that the agency was acting arbitrarily and capriciously or that they were abusing their discretion in suspension and debarment. And I will tell you, it's a tough, tough standard to meet. And I think what makes it more difficult is you can go through the whole process of appealing it, come out, and the agency will just issue one that's done correctly. They'll issue a suspension. They'll learn, right, from uh, going to court, and they will just reissue a suspension of debarment that is correctly done that supports their findings. So even, you know, some companies appeal, but the reason you don't find a lot of them is because all the agency has to do is go back and fix their actual suspension and debarment decision if they did it incorrectly in the first place. So a few proactive considerations to end on here before we take a quick look at the question. Um, <clears throat> suspension and environment is always possible when you're settling civil and criminal um, environmental enforcement issues, whether it's at the state level or the federal level, you just have to realize that it's a backup. It can come from your competitors. I can't tell you the number of times that I've seen things sent from a company's competitor to the suspension and debarment official, advising them that something happened in a particular state that they should take cognizance over, that they should suspend or debar the company for. It can come from unhappy people in the inspector general's office that isn't satisfied that the Department of Justice decided to settle it as a civil matter rather than a criminal matter. Um, it can come from the Department of Justice itself. So there's a number of places where you just have to be aware <clears throat> that you, you, if you have a situation, be thinking in advance, should I just go in and talk to the suspension and department official? Should I advise them that this is going on? I will tell you 10 times out of 10, if you walk in and say, we've got this issue, this is how we're resolving it, they will not suspend you. Um, that's the proactive approach. If you go in proactively to a suspension and department official, they are always going to be more willing to consider what you have to say they're going to be very, very hesitant to ever suspend or debar a company that proactively comes into them and says, we have this problem. This is how we're solving it. We want you to know we're a responsible company. Um, I think if we said many times, don't assume that you have to have federal contracts to be subject to suspension and debarment. And really important is that you have an active and effective compliance program. And it's a general compliance program. It's not just dealing with environmental issues. It's not just dealing with workplace safety. Um, the government considers good companies have a fulsome uh, compliance program in place to prevent all kinds of misconduct. So with that, we'll see if there are questions. So one of the first questions is, um, many non-environmental and safety administrative violations are resolved as criminal matters. How do these convictions impact the company's U.S. operations? Um, so sometimes there's absolutely no impact at all. The only, there's only a few mandatory statutory debarments, um, and it can depend. It can depend how serious it is. It can depend how wide the press on a particular issue is. If you're concerned that there are dissatisfied um, investigators or agents or you're concerned your competitors might bring it to the SBO. I have never had a situation where I regretted bringing a company into a suspension and debarment official proactively to discuss a particular issue. If you go in proactively, they are just much happier getting to know you. Um, they get to know your face. They are very hesitant to suspend or debar somebody that they have met, that they realize has a good program in place and is willing to come forward with issues. Bob, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I just think that you know, non-US violations are going to be treated the same and sort of unrelated to your government business. Is that 
there is the catch-all that if they find that there's been, you know, if, if they think the company as a whole is not presently responsible, that can be a basis for them invoking the catch-all provision. Um, so it, it, it doesn't automatically, as Angela said, it doesn't automatically trigger suspension debarment, but certainly could be used for that basis. So with that, I think we are done with our webinar. Thank you very much for joining us today. If you have questions, our emails are right here at the end. Please give us a call or send us an email. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.